Now you're very welcome back to Team 33 and a call here with you. We are going to turn our attention now to the Nicholas and Elka documentary Misunderstood. It came out on Netflix a few weeks ago, directed by Frank Nastaf. It documents the French striker's uh, journey through the uh, academy at PSG into French football to the Premier League and ends with the notorious breakup of the French squad at the World Cup in South Africa in 2010. Colin Boog is still on the line with me now. Colin, when I first looked at this documentary and seen the opening shot of Dubai and it was nice and shiny, I immediately was filled with dread that this documentary was going to be a complete whitewash of the entire Anelka series or the entire Anelka story. It's not far off that. Here's a quote for you. You have a bad attitude, question mark. Now it's my turn to have a bad attitude. That's Nicolas Analka reflecting on his time at Real Madrid, his one season there in 1999-2000, when he refused to train. Um, I don't know why. Apparently his teammates weren't celebrating enough with him when he was scoring goals, which he didn't do that much of at Real Madrid. Um, Nicolas Analka, like, he... I really want to like him because I remember when he burst through the scene at Arsenal and he was phenomenal. It looked like so much fun to be Nicholas Analka because he was that good. He was racing away from defenders um, and, and always finishing bottom left corner all the time. Uh, but considering this is a documentary which he presumably has complete creative control over, he still doesn't come across well. It's, um, but it doesn't have that... Uh, that charm or magnetism that you want to keep in watching. So I, I watched this twice, Enda. So I, I turned it on first just leisurely just to watch it. And I turned it off halfway through when he was talking about the Canel gesture when he was playing for West Bram and Jalbian. And then I finished it a couple of days later. And then we suggested in the WhatsApp group that we should do this documentary next because it's currently on Netflix. So I, I watched it all in its entirety in one sitting last night. I don't feel any stronger about it. I think it's a bit of an ordeal to watch, to be honest. It's not great. It's definitely... It, I wouldn't put it in the same sense as... Do you know? Do you remember the Juve documentary that came out last yeah. year or the year before? Yeah, yeah, it's not yeah. quite the PR like Ameri- job that that yeah, is. Yeah. But it is very much like... It, it rushes through the fallout with PSG. It rushes through his many, many fallouts where he er- earned the nickname The Sulk at Arsenal. Uh, he... Uh, his followers at Real Madrid. I mean, everywhere Anelka went, and I know the the general point of this documentary is actually, you know, here, there's there's two sides to these stories, which that is completely fair, but they don't mm. delve deep enough into any of these stories mm. for us to get Anelka's side. Yeah, and well, that's it, yeah, because cause he controls it. So from our perspective, we obviously don't know the guy. So we're going by the public perception of him, and it doesn't get any better having watched the documentary. Having said that, the list of contributors is incredibly impressive, all of whom seem to highly admire and love Analka. You have Arsene Wenger, Thierry Henry, Patrice Evra, Patrick Vieira, Didier Drogba, Paul Pogba, Emmanuel Petit and Robert Perez, all speaking glowingly of Analka. These are the most famous names in French football of the last 20 years. Um, world-class players, highly revered themselves. And they all say Anelka is completely misunderstood, which is the title of the documentary. But we don't get to see that side of Anelka. And at one point, I think it's Drogba says it and Vieira says it. Drogba's alluding to his Champions League final uh, penalty uh, miss in 2008, which handed Manchester United the title. And Drogba said, you know, Anelka felt so bad and so guilty after that. And Drogba said, that's the real Anelka. That's what he's actually like. But we don't get to see that. No. We don't get to see it. It's it's amazing that a player who was such a cold character throughout mm. his career, people had this perspe- perception of him, and he made this documentary. This documentary essentially is for him to explain himself and to show that he's not that cold character. And he comes out, for me, even more cold at the end of this, because he, essentially it's... Uh, we'll take the PSG... Claire Fontaine uh, situation. Mm. So essentially what happens in French football is the players go into the academies. This is the early 90s. Uh, so the movement in Europe is only really starting to become a thing between foreign players into the English leagues. And Claire Fontaine was the system that the English or that the players went into for their academies and they were selected by the pro- professional teams. And essentially they had to play their first year. The first contract had to be with the professional team that picked them from Clairefontaine. 
And Anelka went against that, he rode against that, and he decided to go to Arsenal instead. And this was a massive thing back then. Mm. And essentially he just says, well, PSG didn't want me, so I went to Arsenal. And PSG didn't want me. Like, you're 17 years old. Relax. You have loads of time. And he was making an impact at PSG. He came on and he scored. I think he was their second youngest scorer, mm -hmm. second youngest player to play for them um, when he burst through in 1996-97. And then by February 97, he's, he's off to London to play for Arsenal. And then he doesn't uh, get into the team immediately, immediately at Arsenal. And they have a match away to Derby County and he, he refuses to travel. He's 17 and Arsene Wenger has to convince him, no travel, like be patient, you will play. And he comes on in that game and sets up two and gets man of the match. I mean, the, uh, he was just in a rush. And he says it himself in the documentary that I live my life 200 miles per hour. I, I attack everything 200%. Um, but if he just relaxed a little bit, we would be talking nowadays as one of the greatest players to have played in the Premier League or any league he chose. The Athletic are running a series at the moment, the, the best 60 players to play in the Premier League. And Alka should be in that, talent-wise. Yeah, but he'll he, be nowhere to be seen. Uh, there definitely is a, a, a strong sense of a rush in an Alka's Just career. relax. Just because relax. The, the rush to get from PSG to Arsenal and even the rush to get away from Arsenal to Real Madrid... That's I, ridiculous. A, a lovely little dig at uh, Arsenal, by the way. But he, he, yeah, his yeah. explanation was just that, you know, Real Madrid are a far bigger club, so of course I was going to go to them. But then the rush to get away from... I, I slightly understand his rush to get away from yeah. Real Madrid because of the situation that, that was there with the, the press is so suffocating in that country, especially when you're playing for Real Madrid or Barcelona. Mm. But ultimately, again, the, th those three decisions were what led to sort of a spiral, weird career where he ended up on loan. He ended up playing for a Man City side, played in Fernabache. I mean, he, he, the player that played for Arsenal, if he had patience, could have helped Arsenal in the Invincible season. He could have won the Champions League and he could have helped them win the Champions League the following year when they were beaten by Barcelona. We're talking about a transformative talent here that... If he was on the same team as Thierry Henry, who he already had a friendship with from his time in La Fontaine, he could have been one of the Premier League's best strikers. Like, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. It's a common saying for a reason. If you look at Analka's achievements before he turned 20, he arrived in England with Arsenal. In the 97-98 season, he broke through and Arsenal won the double, their first ever Premier League title and the FA Cup. The following year, his last year at Arsenal, he won uh, the PFA Young Player of the Year. This, he, he achieved all this as a teenager. And he was like, no, it's not enough for me. And as you've already alluded to that quote, I need to move to a bigger club, to Real Madrid. And, and even, even in Madrid, I mean, he had, a, he had a terrible time because he didn't score for the first five months. In fact, his first goal for the club was at the, the FIFA Club World Cup that December. Um, and then his first goal in Spain was in the Clásico. And he finished the season by helping Real Madrid win the Champions League and started in that final and was only taken off in the 80th minute. But he just had a ginormous chip on his shoulder for no reason. Everything was going really well. Now, I do understand as well um, that he feels bitter about his omission from the France 98 squad if Amé Jacques, the French manager, did in fact deliver the news in the manner that Analka states he did by saying, you, it's normal. By the way, that quote, which he repeats about three times, I was, under, I, was, I was kind of saying, is this a, a mistranslation? What does he mean by you, it's normal? Yeah, do you remember I, that part? Because I was thinking, I, do you I, mean... I yeah. didn't really understand it at the start, but I suppose if you look into it... His attitude? I suppose it's like, it, it was an easy decision, or like, yeah, you, but it, you know, it shouldn't you know have been, why I made this decision. Or, uh, yeah, but he clearly didn't, because he was a focal point to Arsenal winning the double. Yeah. So I don't understand you, it's normal, without any elaboration. So if that did happen, now we don't have Amy Jack's words, but if it did happen the way Analka said, I understand why he would feel a bit aggrieved. And I do understand that he felt victimised at Real Madrid uh, his first day at the club when the players kept him moving him from seat to seat in the dressing room because that's my seat. That's terrible. I mean, that's no way to treat a new signing. That is horrible. Espe and he's only, he's only a young fella. Especially a league winner for Arsenal who yeah. is coming into your club as one of the record signings at, at this stage. To help I mean, you. Yeah. To help you. 
like um, not to hinder you. It, that that can happen. It was dog eat dog back then, especially at yeah. a club like Real Madrid. Yeah. I suppose one thing that was very evident in this is the perception that Anelka fought the good fight, went up against football directors, went up against football managers. For example, when he was uh, trying to leave PSG and the Clairefontaine issue, it was very much seen as Anelka is fighting against old France that don't want players to go and be their own property. And then when you when he's leaving Real Madrid or when he's having the battles at Real Madrid, he's seen like it's it's a war between him and the presidents, not a war between him and the players. And again, when he at Liverpool, uh, he he claims that he wanted to stay at Liverpool, but Liverpool had one year contract. He said that was uh, his. And when Liverpool got wind that his brothers were trying to sort out a, a move to another club, that's when Gerard Hulley said his attitude wasn't good enough, and it, it was seen to be. The perception he wants to see in this film is that he went up against football and directors, and he picked the wrong fights. And I think is it Thierry Henry or uh, Emmanuel Petit says at one stage that he he generally found himself on the wrong side of arguments. Yeah, I mean there is a bit of a Roy Keane in him, in that he is anti-establishment. But I guess with the difference between the two of them, is that Keane was a midfield general who stayed at, you know, one club for 12 and a half years and brought unprecedented success. Um, whereas Analka kept them moving around the place. I mean, like, the, the documentary in itself literally could not fit all his clubs in. They had to race through them. Because, like, I, I counted last night when I was going to bed at the top of my head. I think, he, I think he played for 13 or 14 different clubs. It's ridiculous. I have them in front of me. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, right? 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. Yeah, 13 clubs. Yeah. But I was like, you have to laugh a bit as well because uh, it was just like, yeah, he went to Fernabache and then two seconds later he signed up for Chelsea. They just skim over Bolton completely. Skip Bolton, skip it. <laughs> that was a year and a half. Yeah, it was. Uh, oh, it, uh, that's, and also that's, the it, second spell at PSG, which lasted two years. They were yeah, just like, uh, yeah, yeah signed for PSG and then he fell out with the manager and then he, he went back <laughs> to he went to Liverpool on loan then. And there's one line about his loan spell at Juventus. Yeah, it's where they won this when where they won Serie A. I, like, I don't know. Look, if they if we're doing this show in order for the listeners to want to watch the documentary, we're not selling it to them. But we have to be honest with people. But I don't know about you. There, there probably just about is enough to to watch the whole thing. The ending. You, you, you do want to see what happens. The final ten minutes is probably the best part of the documentary. If if, I don't know if you agree with that, but it's it's basically it starts with and Irish football fans love yeah. to look back at this and cry the Henri handball because Anelka obviously scored in the first leg in the Viva Stadium in that uh, yeah. in that his playoff. last goal for France yeah and notoriously then when France get to the World Cup that was one of the bugbears from this entire saga was that France went to the World Cup and completely capitulated and it was it was quite interesting to get the insider's information from Patrice Evra, from Henri, mm. from Anelka, what was going on with the players, because I, I know you get a bit of that in Le Bleu as well, but getting the uh, the main character of this entire saga, Nicholas Anelka, who fell out with Raymond Dominic uh, in, this, uh, in the saga at the South a Africa World Cup, the way that it's portrayed is, I think it's fairly okay because it shows that the issue that Anelka had was not really the falling out with Dominic which led to the team mutiny it was more down to the handling of the attribution of quotes to him mm. that yeah. the Anelka had an argument with Dominic in the dressing room and uh, it was on the front page of Le Keep the next day with misattributed quotes of what he said and it just wasn't what he said at all Le Keep is the enemy here, yeah, because I, I think he kind of has a grudging respect for Raymond Dominic, and there's footage of him watching Dominic in a 2018 documentary describing the events, and Dominic point blank uh, refutes the idea that Le, what, what, of what Le Keep said, that Analka said to him, um, and it was a different insult, kind of less insulting. But again, it's a, it's, um, it proves how enigmatic Analka is as a character because you have the entire French squad united behind um, his expulsion from the squad and refusing to train. So obviously this character resonated hugely with his teammates, but it never transcended to the public. 
And I guess that itself is the interest in a documentary. I mean, the other que the big question about Anelka is, is he a waste of talent? Because when you look at his honours list, it's phenomenal. Like, he won the Premier League with two different clubs. He won the Champions League. He won the European Championships with France. Um, he won the Turkish League. He was part of a Serie A winning side. He won the FA Cup four times. PFA Young Player of the Year. Ten years later, won the Golden Boot in the Premier League. So incredible achievements. I mean, yeah. if he was Irish, he'd be on the Mount Rushmore. But... Um, Should have won the World Cup as well. Yeah, exactly. And you say, and he, yeah, and he should have exactly. And, and but yes, you're thinking like he didn't really achieve what he should have, and yet his his CV is incredible. So I, I guess that's the that's the fascination with Anelka. You can't warm to him, but because he's so famously difficult to warm to, I guess that's the attraction of it. Yeah, but it's a tough one to watch. Yeah, it's, it's, it's tough one. listen. It, it could have been done a lot better if it was done by an outsider source or even just a little bit more journalistic. Uh, Liberty was allowed from the Anelka team that obviously funded this documentary but uh, I suppose what, what I found hilarious today when I was researching this film is because obviously the misattributed quotes they're, they're the, the fulcrum of this argument and um, you even have Anelka's lawyer from the time talking about how this set a precedent for journalists to misattribute quotes from now on for footballers they can say what they want as long as an argument happened, yeah, they can say crazy. whatever the footballer wanted. <laughs> and the Daily Mail's document, the Daily Mail's review of this documentary is hilarious because obviously we find out in this documentary what was said in the dressing room. And the Daily Mail went with a headline: "Dubbed Le Sulk at Arsenal, uh, six clubs in eight years, and sent home from the 2010 World Cup for telling his boss to go f himself." Nicholas and Elka's new Netflix documentary will shine a light on one of footballers, one of football's most controversial careers. That's not what he said. <laughs> it's part of this documentary, and that's not what he said. Yeah. Oh, the Daily Mail, the Daily Mail wish they could uh, have that journalistic freedom that they have in France. Uh, I mean, th I actually, that is what I found the most interesting part of the documentary, was the um, legal explanation of editorial standards and what's accepted. Uh, in French journalism was fascinating at the end. And do you know what, I, I was um, like, what? The fact that we watched an hour and a half Nicholas and Elka documentary and the most interesting thing <laughs> from it was the legal precedent. And it's right at the end. At the, in the last three minutes of the documentary, that shows you that this is just not one. It's not one for the books. It's not exactly the Bobby Robson documentary from a couple of weeks ago. But we have to cover these things we because do. that makes the Bobby Robson stuff even better again. It does. We have to have a and it just, it just shows you the difference between when a, a documentary is done by a proper documentary maker and there's proper journalistic input into it. It makes it all that better than a shiny, well-produced... This is a well-produced documentary. Oh, it looks great. You, yeah, can't, looks fault the, you can't fault yeah. the director and the, the filmmakers and the editors because it's, yeah. it's a well-shot documentary and there's great footage in it, but... It's just not, it's just, it's almost, it's just a PR job that's not really done that well. But uh, I suppose that is us right out of time for this week's documentary review. Colm, we, want, we have to do this Gazza one soon. I've been, telling, I've been telling the listeners that we're going to do the Gazza for the last three weeks. Is this the one from 2015? Yes. Yeah, yeah, that's on Netflix too, yeah, yeah. It's, um, yeah, that's a great one. I watched that two or three times. And Very the fact good. that you have, you have the Lazio jersey behind you as well, so... With Gaza on the back. Radio listeners can't see it, but he has the actual Gaza Lazio jersey behind him. So yeah, Gaza's on the back. It, we'll, 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 we'll get that out. We'll crack it out next week. I promise oh, yeah. you we'll do the Gaza documentary next week. I am writing that down and putting it in my, in my diary. Colm, thank you. Love you, We'll take a quick break.